Greetings and welcome back to Room 303. We are in the middle of 30 lectures on Gibran's The Prophet. We're at lecture number 21 and his little poem on talking. Now there's all kinds of uh, interesting ironies that I find in our study of Gibran's The Prophet. And one of my favorite is this fact that here we have Al Mustafa giving these uh, speeches, right? Uh, he's been talking the entire time, and now he's going to talk about talking, which I find fascinating. There's a whole lot of Socrates and Plato obviously playing around with this as well. In some ways, we're back to our lecture number 18 on self-knowledge, and the fact that knowledge is not necessarily wisdom, just like talking is not necessarily speaking. So that'll be a way for us to kind of think about it. And, of course, in some ways, we'll play that out very much uh, in the actual setup. In other words, we've got Al Mustafa standing in front of the temple, and what's he been doing now for all of these poems? Well, he's been he's been speaking, um, but not talking. If we can make that distinction, and I'm hopeful that we can. Now, I've I've suggested to you there's different ways to read these. I love this how the way these poems build on each other, right? I love this little subtenity um, that went from teaching to friendship to now talking, and I love how. So much is built on that. Now our assumption, speaking of, is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, that our playlist is there. I'm hopeful that you're introduced to our intro set of comments and then as well you've been working through all of these uh, different poems we just finished, as we said, with friendship. Now there is an attempt always, as we've said about Gibran, to find this integral, the spiritualist view of, of speaking, talking, listening, the communicative activity. Um, You'll remember, and this I think is very influential in the way that uh, in the way we read uh, Gibran. You'll remember that Gaudama Buddha said that uh, everything you are is a product of what you have thought, and by extension, what you say. And so we're going to follow that one. Um, of course, Gibran's going to point out that talking can be a distraction; it can hinder contemplation and mindfulness. Um, and of course, there's the whole thing about hearing versus listening. So there's two sides to this, both talking as well as listening. And you'll remember those opening lines of Plato's Republic one. We've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net. Do you remember that when he says, how can we hear if we refuse to listen? And we're going to play out some of that as well. Of course, the goal ultimately is to speak mindfully, yes, to speak with reverence, with grace, and understanding. Let's enjoy. Notice, we'll begin with a scholar, which is funny because what is a scholar? Well, uh, maybe you can think of it as a teacher, but a scholar is maybe different in terms of what it is, the kind of talking that the scholar does. Um, is Al Mustafa a scholar or a teacher or a philosopher? See, all of that's going to play into this. And then a scholar said, speak of talking, and of course there's the irony, right? Talk of talking, right? And he answered saying, you talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts. Now that's an interesting line. In other words, if you understood the way you really thought, you wouldn't need to talk. And of course, by extension, we could argue right. So this is an interesting notion that speaking or talking often, and the distinction will be between speaking, i.e. wisdom, and talking, i.e. knowledge, but talking lots of times has to do with a discomfort in terms of the way that we're thinking and therefore we begin to kind of play out in words what it is that our mind doesn't completely comprehend or understand and he continues when you can no longer dwell in the solitude of your heart you live in your lips what an amazing line right you live in your lips and sound is a perversion and a pastime and in much of your talking thinking is half murdered. Notice again the violent language that he loves to employ. In much of your talking, thinking is half murdered. I think that there's a point here to be made. Before we talk, we should listen to our own thoughts to make sure that, am I really going to say this? I mean, we pointed out in 303, just because you have an opinion doesn't necessarily mean that you have to speak that opinion. Having the opinion is fine. But why is it that we feel so quickly obligated to speak our opinions, especially when they are unprompted? Now, if somebody asks, what are you thinking? That's one thing. But we often will provide opinions, and we never actually have been asked to provide those opinions. We just feel we need to because maybe we feel we need to be right or whatever. 
And I think that what Gibran is suggesting here is before you speak, spend some time making sure that you really understand what it is that you think. Because if your thinking is confused, your talking will be confused as well. And then he uses this amazing word picture. For thought is a bird of space. Notice again and again how he comes back to flight and birds. That in a cage of words may indeed unfold its wings, but cannot fly. I can't help but think of T.S. Eliot. I'll mention uh, T.S. Eliot um, several times in our conversations because I think Eliot's proof rock is a classic example of this. Do you remember that famous line, it is impossible to say just what I mean? That inability to formulate really what it is that we most feel. And words often, as they say, gets in the way. Then he goes to the construction we're so familiar with. There are those, and he'll use this now uh, three times. There are those among you who seek the talkative through fear of being alone. Man, there are so many single lines in the prophet and in these poems that you, I mean, you just can, you could write that one down and muse on it for a few months. Wow. That, that, I mean, look at it. There are so many of us who seek the talkative because of fear of being alone. In other words, we don't want to know what we really think, so we jabber and jabber and jabber on and on. And I mean, by extension, obviously, not to in any way denigrate the great world of, you know, um, sending messages through our technologies, Twitter, whatever. But it is true that we, sp we send a lot of words that are, what is it T.S. Eliot calls it, hollow? We are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices when we whisper are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass at rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. We've given full lectures on this uh, poem at learnstrong.net if you want to write it to ground, but I think this is a brilliant insight. And then notice, he continues, the silence of aloneness reveals to their eyes their naked selves, and they would escape. In other words, when you spend a lot of time in contemplation with your thoughts, with yourself, that can become very uncomfortable. So often it's easier to just talk, 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 instead of sitting quietly with those thoughts and working through those thoughts. And, he continues, again, these are, these, I like to point out, well, I've, I've, I think I've said this already a couple of times, but these are heavy words, guys. These are hard words, no question. Many readers of the prophet often will read and, and pick up a few lines that they like, but we are looking at the entire corpus of the poems, and when you put it all together, Gibran is laying down some really tough challenges for us, and I love that, right? It's only, it's going to make us grow, isn't it? Look at this one. And there are those who talk, and without knowledge or forethought, reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. In other words, every once in a while, people talk and they just kind of stumble onto something that's true, but they don't even themselves recognize that it's true. They themselves don't understand the value of what it is that they're saying. He continues... And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. Now, this is fascinating because in some ways, again, the irony, that al-Mustafa is in fact himself calling into question the very words that he has been speaking. Is it altogether possible that if I really knew the truth, my answer to all these questions, talk to us about children, talk to us about, you know, uh, teaching, talk to us about whatever, that if I really understood it, I would just answer in silence because there's nothing to say. Hmm. Notice he finishes this part of the poem by saying, in the bosom of such as these, the spirit dwells in rhythmic silence. The, one, of the, one of the more precious two words and phrases of all of the prophet, rhythmic silence. In other words, when you understand and you live a life of harmony, you don't have to talk a lot. You don't have to spend all your time talking. I think it is significant, and, and some will say, well, how can you balance this with the fact that he is spending so much time talking? And I think the answer that Gibran would give would be, wait, wait, wait. So Alistafa has lived among these people for a very long time, and clearly he hasn't shared these words. They've watched him and yet they've not really heard from him. And now before he leaves, they want to know what he thinks. So after a long period of his life not speaking, 
Now he will speak, not talk, but speak. Challenging, of course, his listeners, of course us, his interlocutors, of course us, as good readers, to listen. He finishes with this one. When you meet your friend, and of course we've heard about his views on friendship earlier, when you meet your friend on the roadside or in the marketplace, let the spirit in you move your lips and direct your tongue. Now, of course, there's uh, in the Christian uh, New Testament, there's a book uh, called James, where there are suggestions about making sure you take good care of your, of your tongue. Here, of course, uh, the, uh, the same is, is presented. Don't, don't just speak idle words. Don't say, don't say silliness because you can create a lot of chaos with your words. In other words, when you are with those you care about, care about the words that you speak with them. Let the voice within your voice, man, there's so many great lines in this poem, huh? Let, your vo let the voice within your voice speak to the ear of his ear. Obviously, a, a profoundly spiritual insight about the words that we speak. Four, his soul, your friend, will keep the truth of your heart as the taste of the wine is remembered when the color is forgotten and the vessel is no more. I mean, think about the compelling idea from Republic One. How can we hear if we refuse to listen? You'll remember that Matthew 11, uh, 15, Christ says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I love that we finish this passage on talking by commenting on the way we want to listen. Because when we speak with those we care about, they will hear the words within the words. They will hear the voice within your voice. And I think, yes, of course, tone of voice matters and all of that, no question. But what are we saying really at 2A? Well, your words are a second expression of your life. And if your life is chaotic, then your words will never be heard by those you care most about. So you've got to be able to balance that with that rhythmic silence. What an interesting idea. Of course, the internal ear then is in some ways more important than the external ear, huh? And the challenge is, of course, to listen when we speak, which is really hard to do, huh? It's one of the reasons why we love and hate to write, huh? Because we've got to take ideas and put those ideas down on the page, and that's difficult for us. It requires a certain level of discipline. At 2B, I love the irony of this, right? Al Mustafa has been talking all of this time, but he hasn't been talking. He's going to point out. I've been speaking, not talking. Now, whether you're able to hear it or not and listen, that's another question. At 3A, so many titles come to mind. I mentioned, uh, of course, Republic One. Think about the, the corpus of Platonic dialogues, those precious dialogues, and the ways in which there's so much talking in those dialogues. I can think now of Symposium as a classic example, right? That we've given full lectures on all those dialogues at LearnStrong.net. Yeah, but think about it. There's so much talking, but not a lot of speaking. And very regularly, you'll have lots and lots of exchanges, but there's nothing that stands really behind it until Socrates starts asking a few questions, and then, of course, all of a sudden, the talk turns into something profound as speaking, right? And, of course, the listening component for that is also there. Think about Dante's Divine Comedy as well, the way in which talking is so important. And Milton's Paradise Lost, there's so many of the classic texts that we love to study that talking versus speaking is always a part of how we read those titles. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own a passage like this if these poems do anything for us? And I think they do, which is why we're spending our time with them. I think that one of the things they do is they challenge us to take a look at our own life, the way in which we live our life, the way in which we live our speaking life. To what, to what degree are you aware that when you speak, you're speaking with the voice within your voice, and when you listen, are you able to actually hear what's being said? What kind of talker are you? What kind of listener are you? What kind of lover are you? It all comes back to your words. Thank you.